Hello, everybody. Hope you can all hear me tonight. Got you good, Jim. Good, good. Well, let's see. It's about five after. So I think everybody that's going to be here is probably going to be here. <laughs> so I won't, uh, I won't hang out and shoot the breeze too much. Looks like we have a pretty good turnout again. Uh, this evening's course is uh, uh, portable and field operations type uh, uh, subject matter. Uh, and uh, there, there may not be a lot of great surprises in this. You know, it's interesting. We put this program, training program together in 2019 before POTA and SODA and, and similar things uh, uh, became very popular. And it's been fascinating to watch the, the explosion in interest in portable uh, operating, uh, particularly on the HF bands. Uh, but uh, hopefully there's some very useful stuff in this. Uh, uh, I would encourage uh, those to and we're going to kind of make this a little more open architecture, you might say, uh, give people the opportunity to suggest their ideas and, uh, and uh, yeah, offer their insights from their own experience and so forth. So uh, it's, in other words, a, a bit less academic, perhaps, than, uh, say, the, uh, the course on uh, emergency communications planning or the like. So let's dig in, and uh, uh, we will go ahead and... Uh, and share the screen and then we will do this let me go ahead and minimize this here and uh can everybody see the see the slides i'm assuming since i hear nothing that you all can yes i've got them good here excellent excellent uh let me do one other thing before we, we go for it. Make sure, yep, I am recording this. So uh, again, this is Radio Relay International uh, Training Course TR004, uh, Portable Emergency Communications. And you can kind of look at this in two dimensions. One is obviously uh, uh, perhaps uh, the Radio Amateur's Guide to Preparing for the Big One, <laughs> you know, the, the worst case scenario, but also uh, recognizing the reality that uh, the, uh, portable emergency communications capabilities are one of the benefits of amateur radio. So, so you may, uh, you know, recall in the uh, uh, introduction to emergency communications planning course, uh, we talked about the disaster communications pyramid, uh, at which the at the foundation of which is survivability, uh, but above which is uh, in second in priority flexibility, right? So, you know, our first and foremost responsibility is survivability uh, as, say, a radio service, because let's face it, uh, we are the, you know, uh, the communication service of last resort, really, behind commercial and government infrastructure. Uh, but it does us no good to have uh, the essential communications services available if we can't deploy them to where needed. And I think this is a pretty timely course, particularly in the aftermath of, of what happened in North Carolina uh, with the, the floods and, and the, uh, the widespread uh, cellular outages, the, uh, the uh, extensive damage to, uh, to uh, highway systems and roadways and bridges that prevented the, the distribution and, and deployment of, uh, of uh, you know, mobile cellular sites. Uh, damages to fiber optic cables, which are often run along bridges and, and things of this nature. Uh, this is a situation where uh, maybe the lone radio amateur could prove to be of, of great value, uh, or a small group of radio amateurs could prove to be of great value. It's also perhaps an incident in which, uh, in which uh, radio amateurs might uh, uh, find it uh, imperative to behave uh, uh, much like a, an NGO or the Cajun Navy, which I like to use as an example, uh, where essentially they organize and they deploy and they make sure they're fully prepared to say maybe deploy to a disaster so, uh, de uh, zone, be self-sustaining and uh, be able to provide communications into which time they can be integrated into something like a NIMS process or, or uh, a broader uh, you know, uh, public or government uh, uh, type response. So uh, we're going to want to kind of dig into this, and, and, and this is a point I've made in, in some essays and blog posts and so forth over the years, and, and that is uh, a lot of radio amateurs uh, believe that they're prepared to, 
to provide emergency communication services in the field because they they do regular portable operating. And, and so, for example, when you set up for uh, parks on the air or even field day to an uh, extent, uh, one kind of uh, one kind of uh, deals from a doctor deck. Uh, one calls CQ, for example, or perhaps he announces his presence on a watch frequency. And stations that have a reliable connectivity uh, call you and respond. And uh, essentially what one is doing is, is you're communicating with locations that propagation favors, right? So, and, and it doesn't really matter to you in that context uh, uh, who you can communicate with, where they're located, et cetera. In other words, there's no imperative that you have to communicate reliably between two, three, or four points and maintain that circuit uh, throughout the day, uh, as one might say, communicating with a state EOC or uh, you know, a relief agency some distance away or, or connecting to a particular node uh, and, a, and a HF data network, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, you know, portable, casual portable deployment is not like MCOM portable deployment. Uh, another uh, mistakes hams make, quite frankly, is, well, okay, I've, I've uh, established communications on, uh, on HF from, uh, from my park on the air location. But in reality, most of your communications is going to be limited to simple, very predictable exchanges. Uh, you know, for example, maybe a signal report, um, reporting one's QTH, if it's a contest, maybe a serial number or the like. And, and in reality, these uh, predictable patterns make it easier to, to copy intelligence or information uh, regardless of uh, uh, conditions, right? So if I have a weak, barely readable signal, okay, but the message content is something that's highly predictable and maintains a pattern, it's easier for my brain, you might say, to, or uh, my, my system, to uh, essentially call that information and translate into something that's understandable and usable. Uh, the world changes when you have to handle communications on behalf of a third party. Uh, when you have to transcribe information where it has to be accurate, uh, as discussed in the basic radio telephone, uh, uh, you know, class, radio telephone uh, uh, procedures class, uh, difficult technical terms. Uh, quantities of disaster supplies, uh, uh, things of this nature. Uh, the message content is no longer predictable. And so you might summarize this by saying that casual QSOs uh, have a lower threshold uh, of signal to noise ratio. Uh, emergency communications, disaster communications on behalf of served agencies or third parties requires a higher signal to noise ratio. Furthermore, uh, if you're casually operating, uh, there's really no need to concern uh, yourself with the battery life. I mean, if the battery goes dead, well, you're done for the day and you go have a beer somewhere at the local pub. Uh, if the weather turns really miserable, you, you don't need to worry about that. You can, you can sign off, say 73 to everybody and leave. Uh, usually you're not operating in the dark, you're not operating in the snow. Uh, you're not operating in, in the mud and so forth after a hurricane or, or a similar event. And of course, there's no concerns usually about security uh, and, and safety, uh, for example. Uh, so again, uh, I wanna, at the beginning, just kind of paint this picture of the fact that just because one can go out and do casual, portable or mobile operation does not necessarily mean that uh, his equipment and his methods are up to the uh, standard that's required for a re reliable uh, emergency communications. Because emergency communications will require that you communicate with specific net stations. Net control, for example, has to hear you. If you're directed to receive a message from another net station, you have to be able to hear him and he has to be able to hear you. Uh, in other words, you need good readability. You need reasonable signal strength. Uh, message contents unpredictable again, as we discussed. And operations may extend over days, right? Uh, and this adds a whole new dynamic of renewable energy issues, logistical support, 
um, and so forth. Uh, you need to keep message forms. Um, you need to have some way of, of storing or re recording the message traffic that you transmitted. You need to be able to keep a radio log, which is more than just a list of stations worked. Uh, you have other considerations, you know, shelter and, and lighting and maybe heat in the winter time and, and, and things of this nature, water and sanitary issues and so on. So, uh, Again, uh, if you're, you're thinking MCOM, and you see this with preppers a lot, I, I, I have both a bit of a fascination with preppers and also kind of maybe sometimes I see it through a jaundiced eye. Uh, you know, I've got my, my bug out bag and I've got my, I've got my uh, you know, my uh, Bofong handheld radio or whatever I've got. And, you know, I'm going to uh, save the day uh, because I can communicate and, you know, maybe I have my, uh, you know, my nine millimeter with me and, you know, uh, some uh, energy bars and so on. But, but in reality, uh, you know, in a real emergency, um, things are a little more complicated. <laughs> and uh, there's a reason armies have supply lines and logistics and, and so forth. Uh, there's a reason why, uh, you know, special operators and so forth are sent to bug eating schools and learn about survival and, and so forth under uh, very extreme and harsh conditions. So uh, again, emergency communications is a different ball game. Now, of course, uh, in many cases, you may be embedded within an MCOM group, you know, OXCOM, for example. Uh, you, you may have a position in OXCOM, you'll be deploying with law enforcement and fire service and emergency management. Maybe the Red Cross is going to be there to feed you and there might be porta potties even available and all the things that you need uh, to support, say, an incident command post or, or the like. Uh, and in this, this case, these factors are not as big a consideration. But if you do ever find yourself, for example, operating independently, uh, you find yourself uh, already in the midst of a disaster area. Um, some of those benefits may not be there. And that, that this, this uh, discussion talks about uh, that potential, uh, potential situation. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit. We'll start with high frequency radio. Uh, um, the main reason being is, uh, of course, RRI is centered primarily on high frequency resources. Uh, and of course, high frequency radio offers some some uh, very beneficial characteristics uh, as uh, as a, a couple of individuals at uh, FEMA um, uh, said to me back in, in 2015, a uh, high frequency radio is the weapon of choice. Uh, the reason being is its survivability as we discussed in the disaster telecommunication pyramid. Uh, one of our duties here is to ensure first and foremost a survivable weapon of communications. Uh, if you have your a radio or a conversation going on in the background, uh, uh, please mute your mic. Uh, that, that would be helpful, I think, for everybody. So let's talk about high frequency radio. And so let's start with the, you know, maybe the 500 pound gorilla in the room. And this is uh, how much power do I need to communicate reliably? Okay. Now, of course, uh, as you all know, in, in many cases, uh, what's called QRP level power is adequate for some modes, be it, uh, uh, let's call them the fuzzy or narrow band digital modes uh, uh, or CW. It's usually inadequate for voice, but nonetheless for CW or certain digital modes, uh, QRP may very well be enough. And and then there's, uh, there's uh, precedence for this in military communications. If you take the, the older man pack radios uh, or, you know, either US or, or NATO, you know, for example, a, a, a PRC 320 or something like that. The default's five watts, the higher power position's 20 watts, right? So, you know, military experience, they kind of learn that you need to have both options. Uh, five watts you use if possible to preserve battery life on a man pack radio, and maybe use 20 or 30 watts if necessary for critical communications. Uh, Keep in mind, however, that in most military environments, you're communicating with a station that has a very good quality antenna system, even if it's field deployed, a log periodic or, or something of this nature. Uh, so uh, 
amateur experience, the stations you might be communicating with have a lesser antenna system. So as a general rule, QRP is the minimum, but it's sometimes helpful from a, a planning perspective to maybe have the capacity to do higher power when needed, be it uh, 10, 20, 30 watts. Even the difference between five and 10 watts for a traffic quality signal uh, can be fairly significant. Uh, so. Uh, again, important to keep in mind, but also understand that there's a trade-off for higher power, which is diminished battery life in the case of uh, portable uh, battery-operated uh, systems. Now, over the years, uh, recent years, RRI has run a fair number of disaster exercises, uh, which have kind of confirmed the experience of, of the military, which is no surprise. Uh, um, again, some people are able to be uh, report on a, a radio circuit, uh, originate uh, messages, uh, you know, at five watts, and, and they can be received. Others need to increase their power. So again, uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of technical details in this course, but again, uh, narrow bandwidth uh, is uh, a benefit at lower power levels. So the two are kind of, let's call them inversely related, right? The narrower the bandwidth of the emitted signal, uh, the the less uh, powers required to maintain a reliable communication circuit. Uh, the greater bandwidth that's required, the greater the amount of power uh, that that's required. Uh, so uh, keep these things in mind uh, when you're uh, when you're making your plans for any kind of deployable uh, HF uh, communications mode. Uh, so again, uh, you know if if you if you're not going to be playing a major role. Uh, Five watts is usually sufficient. Uh, you know, uh, you can communicate when you know conditions are, are favorable. Maybe you're not going to be checked into a net on behalf of an organization or agency. Uh, you know, 24 hours a day. Uh, but um, you know, simple portable uh, FD817 or similar type radio uh, will work uh, very nicely under many conditions. One of the things you want to consider in, in portable operation, uh, particularly in the HF spectrum, is, is the issue of antenna efficiency. So um, again, I can't cover all the possible antenna configurations and so forth, uh, but we'll start with some common ones. And, and, and in particular, these are called the Marconi antennas. Uh, these are the antennas that work against ground, uh, uh, be it random wires, uh, verticals, things of this nature. Uh, a, a typical random wire uh, is uh, needs a good ground system or a counterpoise to be effective. And, and the reason for this is, is what's called I square R losses in soils. So if you're going to utilize a random wire for your field operation, uh, it's not necessarily a problem, uh, but you may want to uh, uh, utilize an association with that, either an elevated counterpoise or perhaps uh, at least a couple of uh, lengths of uh, maybe quarter wave or, or wire laid along the ground. Uh, generally speaking, research over the years has shown that uh, a couple, I mean, two or three pushing ground rods uh, spaced some distance apart are more efficient than one deep one when it comes to, to managing losses in soils. Another thing to remember with antenna efficiency that is once you go be, uh, below a quarter wavelength in length, okay, so for example, a quarter wavelength at, at uh, 75 meters is going to be in the range of 60 feet. If you begin to shorten that ante antenna, say to 30 feet or 20 feet or whatever, uh, the radiation resistance uh, will decrease. Now, the term resistance is a little confusing. Radiation resistance is that characteristic within the antenna uh, itself, the antenna circuit, which actually radiates the electromagnetic energy, right? So lower radiation resistance is bad, generally speaking. A higher radiation resistance is better. Short antennas, uh, um, you know, uh, particularly, you know, again, uh, Marconi-type antennas and the like, uh, they have uh, somewhat lower uh, radiation resistance. A mobile uh, HF antenna, and we'll talk about this in the later slide, may have very little um, radiation resistance and is therefore far less efficient than, say, a, a random wire or a dipole. 
again, uh, broad sweeping generalizations in some respects, but the rules do do apply nicely for portable communications. Uh, so, uh, you know, we could get into a very what you call esoteric, <laughs> you know, discussion of antenna theory, but hopefully this makes some sense. So again, if you're going to run a random wire tuned against ground, um, you know, make sure that uh, your ground is efficient as, as possible. Uh, find ways to mitigate losses in the soils, be it through an elevated counterpoise, uh, you know, uh, maybe some uh, uh, pushing ground rods that are a few feet long, spaced uh, you know, maybe two or three of them spaced some distance apart will help, uh, and so forth. Uh, likewise, when you're running lower power, uh, you may want to consider the efficiency of the tuner or ballon that you're utilizing for your, your matching network. Um, obviously, if you're running five watts uh, in terms of a readability on the other end of the circuit, the efficiency of the tuner or ballon has a greater impact on performance of your portable station. Uh, so uh, you want to kind of uh, utilize a good quality tune or a good quality ballon. I ironically, at, at lower power levels, a, uh, for example, uh, the comp if your you know, components in your tuner or your loading coil or your balance designed for higher power levels, it will usually actually increase your efficiency <laughs> more then it would have a greater impact on a low power device. Not always true, it depends on how it's engineered, but I, I think you kind of get the idea here. So, uh, you know, consider the antennas you're going to use. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, here's, here's two different types of antennas. Uh, we'll talk about verticals in a minute, but the one on the left is a, a vertical antenna over here. Uh, here you can see the loading coils. Uh, here you can see it's being supported by a uh, a, a surveyor's tripod and then uh, you can't really see it in the picture but there's a there's a couple of radials deployed outward and elevated above the soil underneath this uh, uh, underneath this vertical antenna and uh, that arrangement uh, uh, works very very well uh, if you look here on, on the right uh, uh, I uh, back in 2017 I did a whitewater rafting trip down the Colorado River and I took along a, a portable HF uh, a transceiver and uh, used that for uh, periodic check-ins uh, from campsites along the, the bank of the uh, Colorado River uh, where NVIS uh, was kind of the, the arrangement. And you can see, you know, just a, a one of those end-fed half-wave wires uh, was utilized. And again, that's, that's five watts um, uh, and uh, communications was was fairly good uh, so you can communicate with the lower power uh, uh, if needed the same general rules apply to verticals uh, vertical antennas like the one I just showed you uh, function on a very similar you know um, arrangement uh, again uh, elevate your radials uh, if, if possible uh, loading coil design does greatly influence efficiency uh, as does uh, the coil position uh, within the length of the antenna. In other words, as you move the loading coil uh, from the base to the center of the antenna, for example, uh, the efficiency increases because what you do is you lengthen the maximum current distribution uh, further along the length of the antenna. And so, uh, Generally speaking, uh, a loading coil or a matching coil, you might say, uh, that resonates the, the uh, electrically short antenna uh, should be higher in position along the length of the antenna uh, rather than being at the base. Uh, so, uh, and again, I'll show you an antenna that kind of exemplifies a high efficiency so you can compare it to other things that, that are typically used. Uh, so, uh, and again, some things that are useful to have would be an antenna analyzer to, to determine resonance uh, uh, when you're tuning a, uh, a, a loading coil on, on an electrically short antenna and so forth. Now, of course, verticals, and I see the error I should have corrected here, apologize for this typo, but verticals uh, may not offer uh, the best 
uh, NVIS performance. And uh, we'll talk about NVIS in a little bit, but it's near vertical incident sky wave. This is where you actually configure an antenna relatively low uh, to the ground in order to have a high angle of radiation for regional or statewide communications. And uh, usually NVIS is more useful uh, in the MCOM situation than say antenna designs that favor DX, okay? Uh, so uh, again, NVIS, basically your radiation pattern is much at a much higher angle toward the ionosphere. Therefore, it returns to Earth much closer uh, to the transmitting station. And therefore, it gives you uh, usually better connectivity to say uh, a state EOC that may be 200 or 400 miles away or uh, other county EOCs or uh, different, you know, different deployed assets within a, a widespread disaster area, okay? And of course, this also applies to uh, HF mobile antennas. Uh, antenna design is important. Again, as mentioned earlier, the radi radiation resistance value in, in HF mobile antennas is rather low. Uh, they're inherently inefficient. So you have to preserve efficiency wherever you can. Generally speaking, that means a low loss uh, loading coil uh, to resonate the antenna to the desired frequency. Uh, a, a preferred position along the length of the antenna, uh, usually center loading uh, uh, for more efficient uh, uh, operation, better current distribution along the length of the HF antenna. Uh, top loading, if you can add it, this would be something like a capacity hat or, or the like. Uh, some other little things to keep in mind about HF mobile antennas that if you, if you have extensive experience doing HF mobile and you happen to be driving in a snowstorm or uh, where there's ice accumulation occurring while you're driving your vehicle, you will find that uh, this ice and snow will accumulate around that coil. It'll change its cue and its characteristics and it will shift your resonant frequency. <laughs> so you either have to get off and wipe it off periodically or you uh, or you have to uh, uh, you have to maybe have a little antenna automatic antenna tuner into the circuit where you where it'll automatically compensate for some of that uh, some of those changes in resonant frequency that occur uh, with the changes uh, in uh, coupling and so forth and in the inductive and capacitive relationships in, in the loading coil uh, so these are some other things to to consider uh, with uh, with HF uh, uh, mobile. I borrowed this off the internet. You, you don't have to worry about the equation. What you can see here, we have a, a simple formula uh, here. Uh, we have induct inductance, uh, capacitance, and we have radiation resistance. So uh, what happens is radio radiation resistance, of course, is beneficial. That's our, our process of radiating electromagnetic energy into the into the the ether <laughs> or the ether, however you say it. And uh, then uh, to resonate the antenna, you have to match uh, the uh, uh, capacitance and so forth. And you have to load the antenna with the coil, right? So you have to fool the, the uh, transmission line and transmitter into believing that the antenna is actually, for example, a quarter wavelength. And so what you do is you select a loading coil uh, that brings it to resonance and also manages, uh, hopefully, the capacitive reactance that's present in the antenna. Because remember, the antenna is electrically short, so uh, it has a certain degree of reactance associated with it also. So if we take a look at a probably a classic antenna design, this is a famous antenna called the Texas Bug Catcher. Uh, and uh, the Texas bug catcher is kind of notorious for its, for its uh, high level of efficiency. And it's probably also notorious for being very ugly and <laughs> for being very ugly and, uh, and uh, rather uh, weighty and cumbersome. But they do work surprisingly well. And so uh, typically what you have, again, is an electrically short antenna. We have a high efficiency open loading coil you'll notice there's there's no uh, you know it's like an open uh, open coil it's not wound on a phenolic or or similar type of, of 
of uh, material that might introduce loss. And then, of course, uh, often you have uh, capacity hat, which again further improves current distribution along the length of the antenna. It will keep it at maximum uh, generally through the capacity hat, and then it'll roll off as you go vertically through the antenna. So uh, this would be, I guess, what you'd call a, a highly efficient HF mobile antenna. Now, of course, there's a trade-off for this, right? Appearance, a wind load, uh, the mounting system, etc. Uh, it may not be practical to have one of these on your car. Uh, maybe you don't want to look unusual or too unusual driving down the road. So we make compromises, right? Uh, we have the Hustler antennas with the interchangeable coils. We have some of the low profile antennas that still work fairly well, like the, the Comet UHV6 uh, or UHV4 and so on that have smaller loading coils. Uh, perhaps we have those, uh, those helical antennas uh, it it uh, really uh, depends on this trade-off between uh, the mechanical nature of the antenna and the electrical nature of the antenna and finding that place where the two agree. The one advantage of HF mobile operating, however, is that even though it's a compromised antenna, you've got a, essentially you're riding in a generator, right? You've got a full tank of gas, a uh, decent sized, um, you know, battery in good condition, and it's not an electric car, but it's an internal combustion <laughs> engine, you can generally operate at higher power levels uh, from an HF mobile arrangement than you might be able to in the field to say just battery power and a solar panel. That is at least until you run out of gas. And uh, we will touch on that subject uh, a little bit later uh, in the training course. Then of course, there's the ubiquitous dipole. Uh, uh, the dipole antenna is, is really uh, probably one of the better, if not the best, uh, HF portable antennas. It can be deployed between two supports, or with one support, it can be deployed with, uh, in the form of an inverted V, right? Um, and uh, you can uh, pretty much toss a wire over a, a rope over a tree and hoist it up. Um, and I've done that with trees. I've done it with uh, light poles and parking lots uh, uh, at uh, you know police headquarters uh, and, and things of that nature uh, in, in emergency operations situations. So um, you know the dipole antenna has the benefit that it's a balanced antenna uh, and it tends to uh, you have less of these concerns about losses and in, in soil and you know short antenna efficiency and so on. Uh, the, the obvious disadvantage being that, a, a, say, an 80-meter uh, dipole antenna is going to be 120 feet long. Uh, you know, 40-meter antenna is going to be roughly 60 feet long. And so uh, you, you run into perhaps some space issues. But uh, the dipole is, is an excellent choice. Uh, but you need to keep a few things in mind, uh, one of which is, you know, it requires uh, uh, usually a longer length of transmission line. Uh, so this adds bulk and weight if it's somewhere you've got to walk into. Uh, it uh, Poor quality coaxial cable can introduce losses. And uh, it's not unusual, uh, not just in the amateur world, but in, uh, in uh, military and in, uh, commercial communications, for uh, coaxial cable to be stored uh, with the components for a dipole antenna or similar type of antenna. But the problem is some of the... Uh, some brands of coaxial cable, particularly the older ones that have kind of a foam dielectric, uh, that can become hygroscopic over time. And the coaxial cable can actually become kind of lossy, just sitting, sitting in a storage box somewhere or in a 55 gallon or five gallon drum or, or whatever the case might be. So again, decent quality coaxial cable, hopefully not too heavy. Uh, Height, of course, does again remain important to some degree, but again, most MCOM situations, you're looking at MVIS, you're looking to communicate maybe statewide, maybe you're looking to connect to WinLink nodes or the RRI digital traffic network. And of course, if that's the case, you're talking about uh, nodes that may be uh, a relatively you know, moderate distance from you, maybe 50, 100, you know, 200, miles, maybe 300 miles. Uh, 
again, inverted V arrangements are good in some respects. They require one support, and then you bring the other two ends down, and you can secure them with, with just some, uh, some loose bricks or some weights or tent stakes or whatever is necessary uh, to secure the ends. Uh, then, of course, we, you know, just to touch on this, we do have these end-fed half-wave antennas. Uh, with the the un -un matching networks and so forth uh, a lot of people see good success with those uh, but again they sometimes require a little bit of care in terms of how they're deployed and that that's going to be kind of a situational thing so th there are some of the antenna issues that you, you're going to run into but again I, I think the important thing to remember is is the fact that you aren't really interested in operating uh, chasing dx uh, you're interested in usually communications within a state or a region, um, uh, unless you're performing some high-level infrastructure function, for example, like the uh, the RRI uh, inter-area traffic network, you know, point-to-point -point circuits that cross the country. But for for portable field operation, uh, NVIS is kind of the way to go, and you'll find all kinds of videos and and. Uh, and uh, discussions and articles on NVIS, I'm sure, if you want to dig for them. Uh, just remember when you do encounter some of this information, like from some of the preppers and, and people who, you know, who produce these videos, that they're not peer reviewed. And so, so be a little cautious about what you take as, as gospel truth. Let's talk a little bit about modes. Okay, so. Uh, and again, this is, this is uh, non-mode parochial. In other words, uh, uh, we're going to talk about the advantages of mo uh, each, uh, some common modes. Uh, then this assumes that you either A, have the equipment, or B, have the skills necessary to utilize the mode. So in my opinion, probably the best all-around uh, portable uh, field deployable mode is CW, I mean, radio telegraphy. And, and the reason for that is it's, uh, it's rather efficient. Uh, it's, it's certainly more efficient than voice uh, communications methods. Uh, it really doesn't require a lot of power to communicate reliably. You don't require any ancillary devices to use CW. All you need is the transceiver, uh, a source of power, uh, and a key. And uh, that's it. And so you can, you can take a portable HFCW rig and uh, even if you're out in the rain, uh, you can, you know, you don't need to worry about a laptop getting wet. You don't have to power a laptop. You don't have to power a, a sound card interface. You don't have to power a tablet, uh, et cetera. And of course, the, the human brain, right, is, is your tool that transcribes the, the record message traffic. There's no need for printers and, and the like because you can transcribe the message traffic by hand. Uh, preferably, you know, on a if you're out in the rain anyway, a, a you know, a right and rain type uh, pad or something. But but generally speaking, CW is really a, a pretty magical, a portable mode because it balances. Uh, it has relatively narrow bandwidth, uh, therefore a, a fairly high level of efficiency for the amount of battery power that you're going to consume. Uh, you don't require any ancillary devices or you know, cables that run between the, the uh, a computer and, and a transceiver. All you have is the key and your power source, and, and that's it. The flip, the only issue uh, with CW, obviously, is the fact that you have to be fairly proficient in, in, in CW operation. You have to be able to copy code, and you have to have some traffic handling experience. Uh, but if you, if you said to me, okay, Big disaster is happening tomorrow, and you can only take, you can only use one mode, uh, and that's all you're going to have. I, I would vote for CW because of these advantages. On the other hand, for most of us, uh, maybe you know, uh, or most hams, I should say, a single sideband is probably the most ubiquitous mode. I call it a common denominator because pretty much anybody. Anybody has access to single sideband. Everybody's got a single sideband transceiver. The problem with single sideband is, is really twofold. Uh, number one, it's much broader bandwidth, uh, and therefore uh, it requires more power for the same level of readability on a circuit. Uh, it's relatively slow for conveying record message traffic. And, uh, and of course, uh, 
you know, just like CW, it, it fools you into believing you don't have to develop the traffic handling skills that are needed for really effective communications because talking is natural. But in reality, you might not be as difficult to learn as me, say maybe uh, maybe being a proficient CW operator, but you you still have to develop the skills to use it efficiently, right? But as a general rule, a 10 or 20 watt CW transceiver uh, is going to offer the same level of readability, sometimes more, uh, than a 100 watt uh, voice uh, uh, transceiver. And, and that's really important if you're using, for example, batteries and renewable energy. Uh, so, it's so, you know, and it's at QRP levels, single sideband is almost useless in, in, in a net configuration. Um, just again, because of the ishability, uh, issues of co-channel and adjacent channel interference, uh, the wider bandwidth required, and uh, therefore uh, you, you drop, uh, you know, the, the, the minimum signal to noise ratio level is, uh, is much higher for single sideband than it is, say, for, for CW or a narrowband uh, digital mode. Uh, digital obviously um, has uh, a nice combination of benefits. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, certain digital modes like Pactor in particular or Vera, they are automated modes. Uh, they handshake automatically. They, they do error checking automatically, at least within the confines of the communication circuit itself. Uh, and so there's much to be said for the automated modes uh, or capabilities of some digital modes. Uh, some of the new narrow bandwidth modes are relatively slow uh, data throughput, but the very e you can almost uh, uh, decode a signal that you, well, you actually can decode a signal you really can't hear. Uh, so they have incredible capacity to to get a uh, message through, uh, even uh, even when uh, uh, the the signal to noise ratio is really unfavorable, right? But there are some trade offs. Okay. Uh, most of these digital modes require a computer or a similar peripheral, which of course means more power. Uh, furthermore, one of the drawbacks that's often not considered by hams is the fact that if you are supporting an agency or an organization, you're not going to get that uh, incident commander or logistics officer or somebody else to go running up to your laptop or your tablet to read a message every time it comes through. Uh, it's uh, much easier to have a printer and paper and things of this nature where you can print out a message and, and give it to a runner to take to him or you can hand it to him and he doesn't have to try and read over your shoulder while you're handling other communications traffic. The problem is uh, printers require power, uh, paper and ink uh, and uh, uh, computer printers don't do well in damp, humid weather. Uh, again, generally speaking, uh, if you're, particularly if you're busy, uh, a disaster response official is not going to want to keep running over to your operating position to read a message sitting on your laptop or your tablet. Uh, so you, you start looking at the complexities and under certain circumstances, digital is superior, right? If you're, you're at, say, in a communications trailer for your uh, EMA uh, or you're uh, maybe operating from your car, you know, with a computer and it's plugged into your HF mobile radio and you're connected to WinLink, um, uh, digital modes are great, okay? So it all becomes, uh, what I'm really driving at here it all becomes situational. Just as the uh, emergency communications program manager uh, selects the modes and the networks and frequencies that are best suited to each emergency ma management function he's supporting, the radio operator has to look at his operating environment and determine which mode and um, technology is best suited to uh, his or her environment. And that will vary depending upon situation. If you're standing outside in the rain at a, a major uh, railroad tank car derailment and uh, the, everybody's coordinating the evacuation of a population over a one mile radius, 
uh, a handheld radio, a pencil, a write and rain notebook, or maybe a pad of message blanks is probably the ideal tool. Uh, if you're uh, sitting in uh, the, the incident mobile command post, uh, ideally you already have a radio uh, transceiver in there. The interfaces and so forth are already uh, tested and functional. The computer lives there or whatever. Your, your digital might be your preferred mode. It really depends on what type of communications you're handling and from where you're handling it. Because remember the emergency communications pyramid, flexibility. You have to be able to provide communications from where it's needed. And of course, this also applies to VHF, UHF, right? Uh, so for example, uh, you know, antenna height is always a factor in VHF and UHF communications. Uh, uh, we run into some of the same issues that we run into uh, with dipole antennas and HF. We, we have to seek a balance between transmission line length and weight uh, and the uh, height of the antenna that we're going to have to deploy. Uh, for repeaters, it's usually not critical, but for example, for a point-to-point -point circuit or something like that, uh, where it's going to be simplex, then uh, maybe uh, antenna height becomes a significant factor. Okay, where you need to access a distant repeater. Uh, so uh, a couple of tricks that I found work really well is uh, those roll-up J-Pol antennas that you can build easily at home or you can purchase from MFJ. I guess they're not in business anymore, but companies like uh, the former MFJ. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, you know toss a rope over a high tree branch, hoist up the J-Pol antenna and a lightweight transmission line. And now maybe you have an antenna that uh, has a bit of gain and it's uh, 40 or 50 feet up in the air. Uh, that can do you a lot of good. Uh, you can also take a lesson from the broadcast media. Uh, for those of you that worked in radio and uh, television years ago, particularly radio, it was very common for, uh, uh, for uh, radio stations in particular to mount a, a UHF Yagi antenna to a, a tripod or even a mic stand and set that up on a roof during a, a remote broadcast or the like. Uh, you know, they were often called MARTI, M-A-R-T-I, MARTI antennas, or uh, technically remote pickup uh, antennas. Uh, so you can design something like that, you know, using a, a tripod or, you know, an, an, uh, an old mic stand or, or something of that nature. Uh, but again, the idea is that you, you need to be able to establish a good, solid, reliable circuit if you can. Let's uh, shift gears here for a moment. And so now we've kind of talked about antennas and, and things of this nature. And let's talk about some concerns. Uh, uh, obviously, we, we talked about the need to be able to provide a traffic quality circuit. A, a question that comes up often in this course is communication security. And um, uh, in my opinion, this is an overrated, an overrated concern, right? Uh, generally speaking, uh, you can go out, for example, and buy a scanner today that will decode much of the law enforcement communications in your community, even uh, on the APCO 25 and similar you know, digital uh, systems. Uh, most of the communications that you're going to handle are not particularly sensitive. Um, and uh, generally speaking, very few members of the public still listen to scanners. Your, your main interest might be media intercept. Uh, so if you have some sensitive communications traffic to, to clear, uh, it, it might be important to consider communication security. Uh, and so uh, this might be to prevent the media from overhearing uh, something sensitive uh, on a scanner or, or the like. And so, you know, there's plenty of options for this. Generally speaking, the media uh, is not going to be copying uh, communications traffic sent by uh, uh, a digital mode, you know, FL Digi and NBEMS and that kind of thing, or by WinLink or by digital traffic net. Uh, it's rare to find anybody outside of the ham radio community that has a scanner that copies uh, VHF or UHF single sideband. Uh, it offers a surprising uh, a high level of confidentiality. Very few people are going to look tuned down, even hams are going to tune down to say, uh, you know, 144.225 uh, megahertz uh, upper sideband to listen to your point to point circuit. 
Uh, there, there's plenty of uh, uh, plenty of tools out there, even HF, you know, uh, outside of maybe your MCOM community, uh, who's going to know where to find the section CW traffic net or what media outlet's going to say, hey, you know, let's check the, the uh, you know, the state, uh, you know, uh, Aries net on 7232 kilohertz, probably not going to happen. Uh, so, uh, again, you can kind of keep this communication security issue in mind when you're talking about what mode to select and, and so forth. But uh, generally speaking, I, I consider, uh, at least for hams anyway, uh, of minor concern. If you're affiliated with the Mars group or something of that nature where there's a, a an organizational requirement for it, uh, then that's a different ball game. But remember, hams aren't really allowed to encrypt uh, or obfuscate communications traffic anyway. Uh, so you know, keep that in mind. But quite frankly, there's probably nobody at your local TV station or there's probably very few citizens in your neighborhood that are going to find your section CW traffic net and um, even be able to follow the net procedures, let alone uh, transcribe and understand the communications traffic, for example. Let's talk a little bit about power supplies. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, for VHF and UHF operation, these modes require lower power output than HF methods. And the reason for that is once you've achieved the capture effect of FM, for example, uh, you have a solid uh, communication circuit. Uh, repeaters tend to be uh, fairly easy to access if you're utilizing a repeater. Uh, so you can take a VHF FM transceiver out into the field, uh, operated at five watts for days from a deep cycle marine battery or, or the like. Uh, a lot of handheld transceivers are, are ideally uh, have a dry cell battery option. Uh, so, for example, let's say you, uh, you're, uh, again, in an area that's been devastated by a disaster. Uh, you can probably find double A batteries, even if you have to harvest them from, from other devices, right? Uh, they are, they're pretty ubiquitous, uh, generally speaking. You, you can find them even in the in the uh, let's call it the uh, the the uh, debris of a destroyed uh, convenience store you'll probably find some double a batteries uh, if somebody else hasn't picked them already uh, if you're operating again embedded with an ema agency uh, obviously it's good to have a 110 volt ac power supply available because they'll probably have a generator right and they'll have access to fuel to feed that generator uh, if you're not, if you're out there on your own somewhere, uh, HF operations, VHF operations, the solar panel, renewable energy source, and so forth is worth, worth considering. Uh, having an additional battery that you can charge while you're utilizing another battery, uh, that's also useful. So uh, power supply issues are really worth uh, considering. Uh, and we'll dig a little more into that uh, in, the, in the second half of, of this program. So, you know, to maximize your VHF, uh, UHF preparedness, uh, again, uh, look at your handheld radios. Uh, make sure you have an ex uh, uh, what you might call a, a, an extendable antenna for better uh, long-range performance. Uh, look at having some battery packs that use just AA batteries. Uh, keep in mind that you can construct a small man pack unit. Uh, for example, you can take a 25-watt a uh, VHF transceiver, uh, maybe set it to five or 10 watts, and you can put a couple of good sized battery packs in a, in a backpack and, uh, you know, maybe mount an antenna on it. And you, uh, you can have a really uh, high performance portable, uh, let's call it a man pack radio, right? That would offer much better uh, readability and performance over longer ranges than say just a handheld radio. Uh, keep in mind all the little ancillary things you should have. Uh, a list of local net frequencies and repeaters in your region, something like a repeater directory or a net directory. Uh, be prepared to use alternate frequencies or repeaters in, in the event of a disaster, for the obvious reason. Some repeaters may go away. 
uh, understand the value of alternate bands. So we tend to concentrate on two meters. We tend to concentrate on VHF. Uh, but in many cases, uh, for example, in dense urban areas, uh, for example, uh, UHF will provide better building penetration uh, than, than uh, UHF, I should say, 440 megahertz, for example, will provide better uh, building penetration than, say, VHF in the 144 megahertz range. Likewise, when you get into RF dense areas, for example, at an incident command post or something similar where there's a lot of like fire, uh, police, public works, maybe railroad officials, maybe other people from utilities and so forth, all communicating at the same time, okay, you start to run into what we would call the, the intermod problem, right? So at each time you add a frequency, you add a permutation in the form of A plus B, A plus B minus C, A minus B plus C, etc. And you, it, you, the noise floor also increases. So it's good to sometimes to have alter, an alternate band available in case you have uh, this desensing problem, in case you have an intermod problem where your repeater, your VHF repeater frequency just happens to fall on a frequency that's being disrupted by all these different two-way radio frequencies, adding, subtracting, and uh, the noise ending up on your, your uh, Aries frequency. So having access to an alternate uh, VHF, UHF band can be helpful. And uh, so keep some of these things in, in the back of your mind. Uh, I've been out to response sites where nobody could communicate. Not so much in this day and age. Uh, they've made a lot of progress in technology and so forth. But uh, you'd be surprised, uh, you know, 25 or, you know, even 30 years ago, uh, you'd have a major incident and uh, everybody would be, uh, uh, you know, just... Uh, having a great difficulty uh, uh, talking due to the descents and the intermod and all that emerges from everybody using two-way radios in, in a very narrow and confined space. So again, flexibility is very important. A diversity of modes is essential to effective emergency communications planning, and it is to effective field deployment. Let's take a quick break here, then we'll move on with administrative issues. Uh, so uh, uh, we will come back to the slide set, but uh, let's uh, see if there are some, uh, some comments or uh, suggestions or so forth from the peanut gallery. Uh, so uh, <laughs> anyway, gentlemen, uh, anybody uh, would like to raise their hand and, and uh, and um, uh, offer any insights or questions or suggestions. 87 AW. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I don't know if uh, everybody has ever noticed the old World War II movies where you've got a Jeep running along and that antenna is curved and pulled over the top of the Jeep. That's not to keep it out of the trees. It's to make it an NVIS uh, uh, radio. Yeah, those were long antennas. A lot of the, a lot of those uh, World War II, you know, networks operated in the three megahertz range. Uh, they still do, and uh, and you'll see sometimes you get on a military base, you'll see those antennas pulled over because they're using it for NVIS. Oh, very good, very good, good, good insight there, uh, John. Uh, anybody else have comments or insights or even experiences that add uh, some depth and meaning to what we're discussing? Yes. Well, um, your last slide, Jim, regarding uh, VHF and UHF, especially in an urban environment like we have here in New York City, um, with mixing products and noise floor, you also have to consider PL tones. We've, we had a situation uh, for the New York City Marathon start over Fort Wadsworth, which is in the shadow of the Verrazano Bridge. And the tri -Rail Bridge and Tunnel Authority used a particular PL tone on their repeaters, which just happened to be the same PL tone we were using for something else. And their communications bled right through because, you know, there was such an overload. And even though our radios were in PL decode for our frequency, well, it overloaded and brought the PL in with it. So, you know, it's not just, you know, change um, your frequency, change your band, change your mode. Like I like the sideband uh, idea, 
Um, but also be aware PL tones can cause a problem too. And you don't want to match up with something that's being used in the area. So be flexible with that too. Yeah, excellent, excellent uh, point there, Charles. Yeah, uh, you, you may not be privy and more likely won't be privy to all the different radio services that might be functioning in, in a dense environment, uh, you know, especially a, a city the size of New York City or, or Los Angeles or, or, or something of that nature. So, so excellent point. Uh, Gene, uh, N3XUS, I see you've raised your hand. Go ahead, sir. Yes, good everybody on the neck. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound good. Okay, great. Uh, I'm a retired Army dude, worked telecommunications for over 24 years. Just want to let people know that there are a lot of resources, manuals, field manuals, technical manuals out there on the web. Some of them are PDFs that you can download for free. Others are physical copies that you buy, but they are concerning military communications, specifically antenna systems out in the field. Very, very simple systems. Doesn't require a lot to put them up. And there's usually no tuners needed. You just got to do some mathematics and measuring the, uh, the wires. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Something to think about. Yeah, th thank you very much, Gene. Yeah, the 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 army, <laughs> the army has uh, uh, decades of, of experience with uh, you know field expedient uh, uh, solutions, um, uh, portable communications, you know antennas. Uh, uh, they, and they, they, in some cases, they, there's some very fascinating studies out there that the army has done uh, uh, in reference to. Uh, you know, maximizing the efficiency of, say, HF man pack radios and, and the like. So, uh, and a lot of that stuff is available online. So, uh, uh, excellent point there uh, and, and most appreciated. Uh, is there anybody else that has a comment, uh, question, experience that the information they would like to share uh, uh, regarding the content uh, uh, up to this point? AD7AW again? Yeah. Uh, I one of my things is antennas, and I put together an antenna that I still use uh, almost every day, at 40 meter in fed. It's about 10 feet off the ground, and it's a killer. Um, I go all the way from the middle of Washington here to Montana uh, on uh, 40 meters in the afternoon, uh, and that 40 meter in fed half wave is not that hard to put together. I uh, know. No, they're not. And you can buy commercial versions of those, too, uh, uh, if you're uh, uh, not uh, not uh, technically savvy. Right. <laughs> yeah. But the uh, the coil itself, the um, and I've got stacked uh, two and a uh, two and a half inch cores for that. Uh, but with 18 windings on it as an auto transformer to make it a 68 to one uh, uh, or 68 to two. Uh, that thing does very good for me. Yeah, yeah. The the unfed uh, antennas, if, if uh, of good quality, uh, do work quite well. And, and I that I have several of them, which I I, I like and I use use pretty regularly. Uh, so yeah, thank you for for adding that, John. Okay, and any other uh, one more uh, opportunity here? Anybody else have a comment or uh, information they'd like to share before we move on? Okay, let's go back to the slides. Okay, let's talk about the administrative details. We can't overlook the administrative details. Uh, so obviously, uh, I think probably everybody here by now, or most of you anyway, have attended the uh, Introduction to Emergency Communications Planning course and the introduction to the, the, the traffic system course where we talk about tactical versus record message traffic. But the point here really is that you have to have the ability to, number one, keep a radio log when you're in the field, and you have to have the capacity uh, to uh, transcribe messages uh, or print them out, I guess, in the case of a, a digital, uh, 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 digital circuit. So it is definitely not unusual. Let me rephrase that. Uh, that's kind of a double negative. It is common for public safety officials and others 
to come up to you and ask a question about a tactical situation at uh, how many cots did they want at Harding Middle School? Uh, what time did the Salvation Army say they would be arriving with the canteen? Uh, what was the ETA on the water buffalo, uh, et cetera? The, these are things that, uh, that are very commonly asked and they're not necessarily answered by record message traffic. As often as not, they're, ans they're answered by what's called a radio log. So uh, you need to keep a, a decent radio log that isn't just, uh, you know, uh, who you're talking to, but it's uh, the time that the communication occurred, the station with whom the communications was transacted, and a brief summary of the content of that communication uh, with that station. So you might say something like, uh, you know, at, at 2113, you know, WBA.SIW, uh, reported ETA water buffalo at, uh, you know, 1315 or, you know, at uh, 1517, uh, you know, uh, W6RRI reported that 15 co additional cots were required at Harding Middle School. Uh, these are the, the kinds of summary things that you would put in a radio log. Obviously, record message traffic is your ICS 213s, uh, you know, the radiograms, uh, uh, things of this nature that actually are addressed to a, a third party, be it a, a disaster official, uh, a, a position within the NIMS structure, or perhaps a, uh, you know, perhaps a third party in the case of welfare traffic, etc. This is traffic that actually has a text. The text has to be transmitted as written. Uh, and you have to note to whom the message was transmitted or re from whom received and, and so forth. And I think you all know that by now, uh, but do understand the difference. You know, the point here, though, within the context of this training class, you have to have the ability to do this in the field. And so let's start with the basics, right? So we, we kind of alluded to this earlier. Uh, you should have the ability to transcribe messages uh, uh, you know, on paper. This is uh, easily enough done. Paper, pencil, uh, now something in which to keep a, a radio log. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, this is a, a little lesson that you, you may learn someday, but uh, uh, the, the reality is that a pencil is often better than a pen, and you may ask why. And well, the reason for that is pens don't like to work when it's like 20 degrees outside. And so if your disaster occurs in the wintertime in a northern climate and you have to deploy somewhere where it's uh, cold and windy and miserable, uh, you'll, the, the pencil will be a good friend. I learned this doing, you know, uh, land surveys. <laughs> the, uh, you know, you got to keep very meticulous field notes and, uh, you know, you're recording, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the data. Uh, for the survey and uh, and a pencil is really your friend. Uh, so uh, you want to have the capacity to to transcribe information uh, onto message forms and keep a radio log. Okay, uh, one tool that I found is, is very wonderful to have is the write in rain uh, notebooks. I like the level book, which is a surveyor's tool. Uh, of course, I'm comfortable with them for the obvious reasons. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, they have uh, vertical columns in them. Uh, and uh, the reason for that uh, is that it makes it very convenient for creating columns in the field. And I see if I might have one here in the cupboard, I'd show you live, but I don't think I, I have one uh, really handy. But uh, if you take a look at them, they're, they're called a level book. And uh, these you can use in the rain. Uh, it can be raining outside. If you've got a pencil, and you've got a write and rain notebook, you can keep a radio log, okay? Uh, very, very handy. Uh, the, uh, uh, for message transcribing, I found the rapid memo books. Uh, uh, they still make these. Um, as far as I know, you can still go to Office Max or Office Depot or whatever and buy these Adams rapid memo books. And they're really meant for like industrial environments 
or for change orders uh, and, and construction projects and the like. Uh, but essentially, they're a duplicate type of thing. There's a, a white page and beneath that a yellow carbon copy page. Uh, you can put the uh, upper box, you can put administrative data, for example, message number five, you know, priority WB8SIW25, you know, uh, the state of EOC 2313 Zulu, December 4. Um, and uh, then, of course, the two line uh, for the name of the addressee, the agency title, et cetera, the date, the subject. And then, of course, there's a sizable amount of room for both the text and the signature. Uh, the nice thing about these, you get, after you've transcribed the message, you tear off the white copy and you can hand it off to the disaster official and forget about it. But underneath is the yellow copy, which is retained with the booklet. And once you've used up all the forms, you've got a nice, neat book of 50 forms. Um, 50 messages that you transcribed and you're not going to lose and the, these are perfect for dropping into a, a go kit or into a, a packet for an Aries group if you're going to be building up packets for deployment uh, etc so so these work uh, uh, quite nicely as well this is sort of the modern version of, of this guy I don't know how many anybody here will be old enough to remember these now but now this is the old army version that probably dates back to WW2, uh, the big one, uh, as Archie Bunker used to say. Uh, but, you know, the same rules apply here, right? Uh, we want to make sure that we write or print neatly, that our, our writing is legible. Uh, again, uh, you know, you, uh, you have to make sure you put the little cardboard cover between each message blank so you don't get multiple lead through to the other versions. But this is a really great solution uh, for basic... Uh, basic administrative tasks right? so so keep that in mind generally ex speaking uh we want to again format and transcribe the message clearly most amateur radio networks and even most public safety networks are case insensitive okay so for example if i call a police officer on his talk group on an apro 25 system I say a uh, unit five five you know unit five fifty, uh, uh, you know advise ETA, uh, you know that's a voice communication right? There's no there's no uh, formatting necessarily to that. If I say if I uh, take a message and I say I have a message for you from uh, say the uh, Wayne County uh, coroner, it reads as follows. Okay. Uh, that may be transmitted by voice uh, or by telephone. Uh, it's hard to say ultimately how a message gets to its final destination. So as a general rule, my philosophy is we transcribe in all caps. This clearly indicates uh, both to the recipient as well as to the originator that the message may have been relayed or transmitted via a case insensitive mode. Uh, and that also allows it to move to circuits that are either amateur or non-amateur that are case insensitive uh, in nature. Um, generally speaking, where you have uh, scientific abbreviations, you have to be very careful uh, in uh, transcribing these and writing them so they're clear. Uh, or uh, ideally, the originating operator in the interest of these concerns will spell them out. For example, millibars instead of MB, or millimeters instead of MM, uh, and so on. Uh, CC, you know, uh, th things of this nature. Um, uh, again, always remember that last mile connectivity for a message you originate may not be visible to you. You may ultimately not know how that message gets to the addressee. So keep this in mind. But again, clarity and you know, good plain writing is, is critical. Some other useful things to have in, in your bag, so to speak, is extra pens and pencils and a small pencil sharpener. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some extra notepads. Uh, uh, things of, uh, of this nature. Uh, and of course, the, the little extras, the extra RF adapters, the extra DC cable connectors and adapters, some spare flashlight batteries, uh, a small headlamp or, 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 or the like. 
Uh, I found these to be very useful. You can buy these in most states. Uh, they're not as common as they used to be uh, thanks to GPSs. But I found few things are a replacement for, for detailed uh, uh, maps. Uh, and I found these two types of versions work really well. One is the, the Atlas and Field Guides uh, can be very useful. Uh, they're kind of designed for hunters and fishermen. And then of course, uh, these, uh, these topographical maps uh, that are uh, typically published uh, by state. I believe these are still available, but you pretty much have to buy them online. Uh, but they can be very useful for uh, an MCOM situation, even if it's just to, uh, to note the location of uh, where various stations and, and uh, you know, fire uh, stations are located and, you know, uh, where roads are, mark where roads are washed out, uh, bridges are collapsed, uh, important information, right, uh, that uh, somebody may need in the course of a disaster operation. Uh, so uh, useful things to have uh, in, in your in your box. Uh, some other uh, things to think about is uh, is uh, uh, essentially uh, when it's important not to be noticed. Uh, now, now, hopefully, uh, you won't ever be in a position where, <laughs> where you need a uh, uh, you know a, a Luger or a forty five and uh, and uh, a GRC one hundred nine uh, maybe or something like that. Uh, uh, but uh, I just thought this was a cool photo to to inject in here. But there are also times it's important to not be noticed, uh, and uh, it's not because you're a spy or doing you know secret secret squirrel stuff. Uh, but uh, disaster areas can present security risks. Uh, so you know we've we've had reports of amateur radio equipment being stolen um, uh, during uh, disaster operations. Uh, some of you who were around during Hurricane Katrina may have read reports from individuals about some of the very unpleasant uh, circumstances that emerged uh, during uh, in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina some years back. Uh, in, in certain situations, it might be best not to reveal the fact that you have set up a communications uh, a system or even like a, something a little more uh, complex like a small message center, right? Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, so for example, if I want to set up a health and welfare operation uh, in, in an area that's been devastated by a disaster, uh, I might, uh, you know, ideally I'm embedded with a, you know, public safety EMA organization or the Red Cross or whatever. But if I'm not, they, they haven't arrived yet, uh, you know, again, situation like uh, North Carolina, where as many days before, in some areas before, uh, you know, uh, relief agencies were able to to deploy resources. Uh, it might be better maybe to set up my my uh, communication system in a, a somewhat secure area, out of sight, uh, and uh, you can still interface with the public. Have uh, uh, volunteers collect welfare messages at a secondary location and then uh, transport them to, to the communication site. Uh, so there are security considerations that sometimes uh, need to be considered. I can tell you from my experience responding to major disasters for, for uh, uh, one of the nation's large class one railroads uh, that uh, generators are a major target of theft. If you, <laughs> if you have a railroad, critical railroad signal uh, system uh, and you have a uh, guy out there setting up a generator and he tries to chain it to a post, a tree, or, or whatever. Uh, I can guarantee you that in a lot of areas, uh, uh, that generator will be gone within an hour, uh, maybe less. Uh, sometimes as the tail lights uh, disappear around the corner. Uh, uh, a common trick uh, for uh, uh, in, in these kinds of environments that the railroads do is they they will uh, they'll place the generator somewhere adjacent to the site in the backyard of somebody's house. Uh, and they'll walk up to the guy's door and they'll say, okay, tell you what, uh, I can't give you all the energy from the generator, but if you've got a refrigerator or a freezer, uh, you're welcome to plug it in. Uh, the only thing we ask of you is that you, you need to have somebody watch that generator. A lot of times you see the guy sitting there with a shotgun. <laughs> 
you know, watching the generator because you know there's, uh, he doesn't want to go out and buy a freezer uh, full of food, right? So, uh, but generators will disappear. And if you have a nice noisy generator uh, sitting behind a building operating uh, to operate your station, uh, it will draw attention. And sometimes it will withdraw, it will draw the wrong type of attention. Uh, some disaster areas are surprisingly quiet. Refrigerator compressors aren't running. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the furnaces and air conditioning compressors aren't running. Suddenly things are very quiet and somebody can hear your communications, uh, you know, multiple houses away or blocks away. Uh, you uh, may attract again unwanted uh, attention. Uh, just as generators are targets for theft, so might be food and water supplies uh, and, uh, and, and so forth. And of course, security just doesn't involve theft and, and, and this kind of thing. It also involves sanitation and medical supplies. So you need to consider sanitation, drinking water, medical supplies if they're needed, uh, things of this nature. Again, in the ideal world, you will be embedded with uh, an agency uh, active in the NIMS process. But what we're beginning to see is that it doesn't always work that way. And in the worst case scenario, uh, it might not. And I, I'm not going down the proper rabbit hole, but just to suggest that maybe response may not always be a prompt, as prompt as you would like uh, in a major widespread disaster. Uh, intelligence is important. Um, uh, understanding your environment. Uh, and, and this is the sixth sense kind of thing. Uh, you know, what are some of the emerging risks? Uh, civil unrest, you know, for example, uh, during a major disaster, there might be issues like hazardous materials releases. Uh, if you were in Japan at Fukushima, uh, you would certainly want to know that uh, that the nuclear power plant had been damaged and, uh, had, uh, new, uh, and uh, radioactive uh, materials were, were, were loose. Uh, you know, pending levee breaches, uh, uh, additional infrastructure failures. Uh, these are all things that are of useful information to you. So if you are in a group and you're responding and you have the available personnel, uh, human resources, it may be wise to assign somebody to essentially collect intel, monitor the public safety channels, uh, monitor uh, you know broadcast media if it's available. Um, you know maybe uh, uh, if you uh, have the national SOS radio network and ham watch programs functional, uh, collect uh, situational awareness data via those resources. Uh, Again, intel functions can uh, often be performed best off-site somewhere and then transmitted in the form of brief summaries or sit rep reports uh, to those that are deployed in the disaster area. Uh, so again, intel can be important. Uh, use your sixth sense. Uh, you know, hopefully you'll never encounter any of these things, but in the interest of completeness, you should be aware of this again. You know, back in 2020, if somebody if somebody had told me in 2019 or 2018 that that uh, 240 bill I think it was 240 buildings were going to be burned uh, in uh, Minneapolis, I, I would have said, "Now nah, that's not going to happen." But yet it did, right? Uh, you know, so uh, you know there are things that happen that seem, you know, uh, unreasonable. You say, "Well, that would never happen," but they do. Uh, so just, you know, uh, something to keep in mind uh, if you uh, are deploying. Uh, 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 some other things to think about, uh, uh, lighting. So again, if you're operating overnight, you're going to have some kind of uh, light. Uh, uh, we can start with the old gasoline lanterns. Uh, I've got a, a, several of these, uh, uh, one that lives up at a remote lake cabin and, and another one here uh, uh, for my camping supplies at home. Uh, these older uh, gasoline lanterns are, are much more efficient than the propane uh, gas lanterns. You know, uh, I use the little propane cylinders. As a matter of fact, the white gas, the Coleman white gas, for example, is uh, 13 times more efficient than propane. So you can run a Coleman lamp for a long time on a gallon of white gas. 
uh, whereas uh, the propane cylinders run out pretty quickly. And in cold weather, due to the nature of the ideal gas law, uh, they will sometimes freeze up and not work at all. Uh, but the advantage of the, the older gasoline lanterns, of course, is that they have a nice broad area light and they do produce some heat. Uh, the drawback, of course, is you don't want to use them in a very confined or poorly ventilated space because of uh, you know, the, the issues of carbon monoxide and the like. Uh, today, LED lanterns are very common. Uh, they can operate for a long time off of, off of simple batteries, uh, D cells or AA batteries or the like. They don't have to have any fuel, etc. Of course, they don't generate any heat. Uh, some, however, do produce RFI. Uh, same with the older fluorescent lanterns. So if you have an LED or fluorescent lantern, uh, before you take it into the field for either casual operating or or for uh, or for uh, uh, or for uh, uh, you know an emergency response, make sure that the the LED or fluorescent lantern doesn't generate RF. Uh, obviously, uh, you know uh, shelter is important. Uh, again, ideally you'll be embedded with a relief agency, but uh, you never know. Uh, you may have to set up a, a tent or awning or something similar for some protection from the weather. Uh, obviously, considerations are proximity to the served agency or the community you're trying to provide communications for, uh, suitability for antennas and power source. Uh, you may need to locate it somewhere where there's a relatively no low noise floor. Uh, you can usually survey the area with a small transistor radio. Again, security is a concern. Uh, and then, of course, access to uh, power lines and telecommunications cables if required. Uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, uh, there's a wide variety of options here. Uh, folding tables and you know, lightweight tables and chairs can be really easy to transport. Uh, there's uh, little collapsible picnic tables you can purchase from uh, camping uh, goods suppliers like Bass Pro Shop and, and Cabela's. Uh, there's lots of options here for, for shelter. That we touched on sanitation. It's nice to say, hey, I'm going to go set up a comp center and help out my neighborhood or my community. Uh, but if there's no toilets, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a portable toilet, uh, a hunter's loo, uh, a little bit of privacy along with it, uh, uh, hand sanitizer, paper towels, uh, a little bit of kitty litter, uh, you know, in case you have to dig a slit latrine or something of that nature. Uh, some lime to control flies and odor, and uh, some procedures to avoid disease transmission. Uh, you know, this is these are all some things you need to think about. Uh, the same is true on the other end. Uh, as Napoleon said, uh, an army marches on its stomach, so communications volunteers must eat and drink. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, uh, basically, uh, the, uh, uh, you need some drinking water okay uh, for uh, for each person uh, you need a little bit of water maybe for cooking uh, for preparing coffee uh, you need uh, you know uh, for example canned goods uh, MREs or some other type of food that's easily stored without refrigeration you need a way to cook and heat water and do things of this nature so this is this is uh, you know uh, I have this an old camp stove just like this one uh, again, uh, it might be 60 years old, but it still works, right? So uh, keep in mind some of these things that are essential to supporting a, a de uh, deployed group. Uh, weather is also a consideration. Uh, so, you know, obviously there's many sources today for weather information. We're operating on the assumption that cellular data networks are out, uh, maybe internet connectivity is not readily available. Uh, so. Uh, um, you know, let's uh, let's face it. You you might want to be weather wise. So a little bit of understanding of meteorology uh, is is good for facilitating uh, uh, making your own forecasts and judgments. Uh, uh, as uh, the 19th century uh, novelist and contemporary of Mark Twain said, Charles Dudley Warner, everybody complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. But uh, for example, just having a, a little portable barometer with you. 
Uh, if you know your deployment's going to be over a couple of weeks or possibly or long term, uh, can be a very, very useful tool uh, for uh, identifying weather trends. If you know the barometric pressure is uh, falling or rising rapidly, you know the wind direction, you know, you, know, you kind of know a little bit about identifying clouds, you can make some very accurate weather forecasts just through these simple observations, okay? And uh, again, a, a decent quality barometer is, is something easy to obtain. Uh, I'm not gonna spend tons of time on goat kits because there are probably thousands of examples on YouTube. Uh, but I like the idea of a scalable approach. Uh, that is maybe for your day-to-day -day, uh, operation, it's a, it's a small bag with a, you know, a handheld radio, spare battery pack, uh, maybe some, uh, you know, some uh, message forms and uh, a notebook and some pencils and the like. Uh, you know, that's just your day-to-day -day thing. Uh, then uh, a basic kit for higher risk situations, right, where you start adding some additional components and equipment. And then, of course, uh, you can do a more advanced uh, arrangement for uh, field deployments that you know are going to be long term. You know, for example, if you're going to de be uh, deployed to uh, uh, be deployed to uh, a, uh, an incident command post or, or the like. Some basic rules I like to uh, like to suggest is number one, make sure you test your, your field equipment regularly. POTA is a great way to do it. Uh, there's an Aries group here in uh, not too far away. They, they uh, in the summer, they once a month, they have a uh, an event where uh, they, on the weekly Aries that they announce that they're going to all meet at a particular city park or county park, and they all show up and set up their portable stations. And they do it like during the warm summer months, July, August, you know, into September. And it's very popular and it's a lot of fun and, and they, they definitely, definitely uh, have a good time doing it. But, you know, test your equipment periodically in the field. Uh, and more importantly, don't be, be, avoid the temptation of pilfering or borrowing items uh, from your, your go bags. Uh, this is a real problem that turns up where people say, I forgot, I borrowed that SO239 to BNC adapter uh, when I was, uh, when I, I hooked up my new HF transceiver at home. Well, then you don't have it uh, in the field, right? Uh, so again, uh, the minimum is an HT, maybe a spare battery pack, a small notepad and pencil, uh, you know, uh, maybe keep it in a little dry box, uh, something that can just be tossed in your overnight bag, or if you're a woman, you know, you got a halfway decent sized purse, uh, you've got uh, some basic communications with you. It allows you to access the repeater, monitor normal weather radio, monitor local public safety frequencies, and the like. Uh, in this day and age, a complete station can be carried in a small bag. Uh, I often uh, hear discussions or read discussions online. A guy will say, you know, I'm a relatively new ham. I want to get a portable station. You know, what should I use? Personally, I like the FT817 a lot. And the reason for it is it's small. And uh, it uh, covers uh, both uh, HF, uh, VHF, and UHF frequencies and multiple modes. And you can stick it in a small bag and uh, it's, uh, it's relatively uh, uh, compact. Today's technology is so much improved that it's very easy to fit a complete station in a small backpack along with a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, pencils and, and uh, you know, a small, uh, you know, small uh, LED lantern, a, uh, you know, message forms, a write and rain notebook, uh, all the things that you need to deploy uh, in time of, of disaster. Uh, so this is this is one setup that I have. Uh, here's a complete FT817 uh, with the CW key, the mic, uh, a battery here is kind of not visible in the picture, a nickel, nickel metal hydride battery. Uh, and then I've got an antenna kit like this uh, with a couple of different antenna options, a charger for the nickel metal hydride batteries, uh, loading coils, and that all rolls up into a nice, neat little a tool bag that you can carry around. And uh, so th this one time, just for fun, I, I set it up here in a, a hotel room 
and uh, it worked out amazingly well. And you can see it's clamped to a, the little table here at a Holiday Inn Express, and uh, I had good, reliable communications uh, uh, around the East Coast. I think this was down in uh, North Carolina, as a matter of fact. And uh, so you can you can really do some cool things with the with the newer radios, right? And and again, you will develop your own based on your own needs, requirements, budget, etc. But really, all you need is is just a decent little bag of some kind, uh, kind of a rugged, uh, water resistant bag, you know, to put your HF VHF uh, transceiver in there. Uh, you know, your keys, your microphones, your batteries, your charger, uh, and your, your miscellaneous administrative tools. Uh, so uh, um, not, not much to it here. So for example, in this arrangement, you have an FT817 and tuner, a key, uh, Arbor's uh, throw line for tossing, uh, you know, uh, hoisting an antenna up into a tree. A uh, half wave end fed uh, antenna for uh, 40 and 20 meters, uh, roll up J poles, some extra transmission line, you know, an HT, things of that nature, all, all fits in a ni nice little bag. And uh, you may want to consider, again, in the concept of uh, having a scalable approach, maybe something that offers a little bit more power, right? So the FT817 is five watts, but you can buy these little aftermarket uh, 50 watt HF amplifiers. And you can uh, build one into like an ammo can like this one, where it's uh, there's actually in this box a 120 volt AC power supply, a, an automatic antenna tuner, and a uh, a uh, uh, multi band uh, 50 watt uh, RF amplifier, uh, all kind of built into uh, an ammo can, and uh, it uh, that way you can deploy that. You can run it either off 12 volts like in a car, or you can uh, run it off 120 volts. Uh, if you have it uh, available. Uh, again, you usually want to have more than one battery, uh, be it uh, gel cell or nickel metal hydride or the like. Uh, this allows you to utilize one battery while the other battery is charging. Uh, and you, uh, again, need some options for charging, right? Be it from uh, vehicles or from a solar panel. And in this day and age, there's a lot of really nice solar panel options available out there. Uh, but again, understand that solar panels uh, are, again, subject to all the limitations, right? Time of year versus angle of the sun, uh, uh, amount of extent of cloud cover and duration. Um, they're going to be less efficient, say, in the fall and winter than they will in maybe the late spring and in midsummer. But again, uh, you need to exercise this stuff out in the field for fun. Uh, before you're called upon to use it uh, in a disaster. Uh, there's all kinds of antenna options. Uh, this is a, a older military dipole kit uh, uh, that uh, kind of lives on a shelf at my, uh, at my office uh, in the storage room. Uh, you can build a, a simple random wire antenna using a chalk line reel. Uh, this is an older, uh, oops, older high gain, uh, high gain, uh, uh, tape reel dipole. Uh, now these were pretty uh, common uh, uh, years ago in commercial and military uh, 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 environments, and they work quite nicely. You host this, you hoist this guy. You actually calibrated meters, and you you just pull it out to where you need it. You clamp it down. You hoist the thing up into a tree, and you got yourself an inverted V. So there's all kinds of ways you can build out an antenna kit. And obviously, I'm not going to give you a one-size-fits-all recipe. You'll need to kind of figure that out a bit uh, for yourself, right? And so, uh, again, uh, you know, keep in mind, you know, that uh, this depends on you, your environment, uh, what agencies you normally work with, what your hazards and vulnerabilities are for your community, and so on. Uh, in this example, this bag has a bunch of HTs in it. Uh, so you can see there's a VHF uh, uh, two meter handheld, a marine band handheld, uh, a UHF handheld, a uh, commercial version, uh, and uh, they all use the same battery pack, which is in their older, admittedly. They all use the same battery pack. I always have an air band version as well uh, for uh, in this bag. Uh, so these are uh, older HTs, but they, they still work and uh, they can still serve fine uh, in, in time of emergency. 
Uh, this is uh, N6IET uh, uh, operating portable during an RRI MCOM exercise. Uh, you can see how he's arranged his uh, portable QRP station. It's actually pretty clever. Everything's mounted on a board. It's easily transported and carried to where he wants to operate. Uh, worst case scenario, you put it in a duffel bag and you're ready to go. You can see the, the nickel metal hydride battery here. Uh, and uh, I think that's probably a KX, you know, KX-3 or something like that. I, I don't know the Yellowcraft radios that well, but uh, a pretty, pretty clever way to do things. Uh, K9ZTV uh, uh, designed this, uh, uh, and uh, I believe I published an article about this in the old QNI newsletter, uh, but here you can see uh, uh, a mass that will support a dipole or a, a high VHF or UHF antenna. Uh, and you, it, it's, it's significant, uh, but from what I understand, it's fairly lightweight. And, and again, a, a really clever idea from a K9ZTV. So uh, again, uh, lots of ideas out there. We should talk a bit about generators before we close. Uh, um, the biggest problem with generators that you're going to encounter in a widespread or significant disaster is the scarcity of fuel. Uh, you know, we take for granted that there's always gasoline in the underground tanks at our local service station. But uh, if there's widespread power outage, uh, most gasoline stations, most service stations don't have backup power. So the pumps don't operate. Uh, in a disaster, Gasoline sells out very quickly. Uh, when gasoline is brought in, it's usually given, priority is usually given to public safety and fire service and, and similar high profile agencies. Sometimes they will even fight over the available gasoline and argue about who deserves it more. Uh, you are going to be near the bottom of that totem pole. And uh, so, uh, you should have some gasoline on hand, but you should use the generator and the gasoline very sparingly, uh, particularly if you think it's going to be a long-term event. Uh, there's lots of older generators out there. I've got two of these home lights I bought back in 1980, I think, uh, and they still work great. Um, they are a high RPM generator, so they make some, some noise. And there's a bit of ringing on the waveform. Uh, the modern inverter generators tend to run a little quieter. They have a cleaner sine wave uh, that's better suited to switch mode power supplies and modern electronics. Uh, it goes without saying probably, but you want the generator to be some distance away from your building or shelter. And uh, I think particularly with these older generators, uh, uh, I would incorporate uh, maybe a little uh, disconnect or something uh, um, that's either fused or has a circuit breaker and uh, maybe a way to monitor the, the voltage and frequency if, if you want to go through the extra trouble. Uh, these are two sine waves. Uh, the one on the left is produced by that home light generator uh, that you just saw. Uh, and the one on the right is produced by a modern Honda generator. Uh, they're both nice 60 hertz, uh, uh, 60 hertz uh, 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 frequencies. They're very stable at 60 hertz. Uh, they both uh, they both uh, produce the required voltage. Uh, the number of uh, volts per division is just different here in this photo. Uh, but as you can see with the older generator, there's kind of a ringing that occurs. And it's a good waveform. Uh, and older equipment operates just fine, but if you try and plug a modern big screen TV uh, into this or some of the computer power supplies, what you'll find is they just do not like that little bit of ring on the sine wave. And some of them will, will not work uh, quite the way they should. This is a Honda generator uh, of the inverter type. You see it's a much cleaner waveform. So I'm not saying that you can't use the older generators. I still use mine, but you may find, particularly with some older equipment uh, that, uh, or I'm sorry, with some of the newer equipment, uh, that uh, the older generator waveforms can be a bit problematic. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about gasoline. Gasoline does not age that well, uh, but first and foremost, you want to store it in a good safety can. Don't buy those cheap plastic cans 
uh, go out and get yourself a good quality safety can um, that will keep it uh, keep it tight. It will prevent uh, or slow degradation of the gasoline, and it's much safer for use out in the field. Okay, uh, generally speaking, it's unwise to fill generators while they're running, and uh, you can if you want. Like your generators are going to sit for several months at a time. I prefer to run the gas out of them. But if I don't, you can purchase some stable or sea foam or something of that nature as a gasoline additive. What I found is that in the era of ethanol mixed gasoline, uh, that carburetors do not deal, deal well with the gasoline sitting in, in, the, uh, uh, in a, a generator that's uh, got long periods of non-use. Uh, so again, I would encourage, particularly in this era of of the, the uh, ethanol mix gasolines to, when you're done with your generator, run it out and leave it dry, and it'll be ready to start next time around. So uh, I guess I'll leave with these, these points. Uh, again, uh, as we mentioned in other classes, it's not enough to establish communications or connectivity, I should say, one must also communicate effectively, okay? And communication is defined as a message being tendered for origination, passing through the communications network, coming out the other side, and then being delivered intact and accurately. That's communications. The fact that I can hear you on a radio circuit is not communications, that's connectivity. So learn how to communicate, learn proper traffic handling techniques, learn efficient radio procedures, learn how to keep an accurate radio log, you know, a summary of tactical communications, uh, learn how to, you know, catalog uh, record message traffic, store it for later reference, uh, understand the importance of brevity and accuracy in all communications, and always consider interoperability. Just because you have a digital terminal sitting in front of you does not mean that when that message reaches uh, the last mile that it's going to be delivered using the same mode or method, be it amateur or otherwise, because brevity is both the soul of wit and the soul of emergency communications. So that's the conclusion of the slide set. I'm going to stop the share and uh, we now open it back up to rotten tomatoes, uh, flowers, uh, you know, comments, insights, etc. So who, who's my uh, my first victim? AT7AW, uh, with regards to a generator, uh, propane is uh, available for a lot of them, uh, dual fuel, but uh, propane is about the same equivalent runtime as the same quantity of gas. And uh, you can just grab the cylinder off your barbecue if you have nothing else. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. You know, uh, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. We'll go through some of the chat things here, too. So uh, we, we will we will dig into that. Uh, the chat ones here when we're done with the verbal, the verbal comments and so forth. Uh, I appreciate that, John. That's a good point. Uh, any other uh, comments or suggestions or personal insights? OK, so let's uh, let's do this. Let's go through some of the comments. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody said uh, my question uh, or comment is: uh, is 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 the is it important to know first aid? If you mentioned it, then I beg your pardon. Uh, please don't throw away good coax cables; they become handy sometimes. Uh, thanks again. So a couple of good comments. Yeah, I I think uh, you know hang on to them. Uh, I guess a lossy coax cable is better than no coax cable. You know, I'll, I'll certainly give you that. And, and thank you for bringing up first aid. Yeah, first aid, I, I think, is something that we should know. Um, and it's not hard to learn. Uh, Red Cross offers uh, first aid training and as well as other organizations. And, and Lewis, I, I think that was a good point that uh, you know, we should know first aid. We should probably know CPR. Uh, we should also remember that if we're going to be in a disaster area, our uh, uh, first and foremost responsibility is to prevent injury to ourselves, right? 
you don't want to become another victim who needs to be uh, extricated. Uh, so this means things like you're going to be encountering uh, boards with protruding nails. You're going to be uh, uh, encountering low hanging wires and cables, perhaps. Uh, you're going to be around structures that are damaged, which means you should have what's called PPE or personal protective equipment. Uh, for example, maybe uh, good solid work boots, uh, some work gloves, um, uh, maybe some safety glasses, maybe even a hard hat in case it's needed because you will be in an area that's potentially uh, problematic. Uh, same thing to, uh, you know, uh, situational awareness. Uh, if you're down south in some of the, the southern states, uh, be aware of things like snakes and, uh, you know, other poisonous critters uh, and the like. So, so very good, uh, very good point from Lewis for sure. Uh, hey, Jim. Yeah, Charles, go ahead. About the coax cables, um, don't be afraid to store bad coax cable. The reason why, even a length of bad coax, you can use it for support rope when you don't have rope. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you certainly can. Um, so uh, I've done that to... plenty of times, and it, it works great. That's a good point. You might want to color code it, though. That yes, too. definitely. You have to mark it somehow. You know, put an orange little uh, ribbon tab on, you know, flag on it or something. But uh, why throw it away? You can use it for something. I've lashed poles and all sorts of things with bad coax, and it lasted a good long time. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I once hauled a uh, a Phelps Dodge Station Master antenna up the side of a uh, a downtown uh, building. Don't tell anybody this ever. I'm as I'm recording it, but it, it was only a couple stories left on the building, and there was an uh, an outcropping, so I wasn't too concerned, but I used a piece of coax to finish the trip uh, up to the rooftop for installation. <laughs> so, you know, coax can come, <laughs> coax can come in handy on occasion. Uh, but uh, yeah, good point there. Uh, James, uh, somebody had a comment. They wanted some information about the LIFP04 batteries. I can speak to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, man, you feel free. Uh, go ahead, John. Okay, uh, my whole station runs on 12 volts, but I've got a charger as well as solar uh, crushed uh, LIFP04 battery. And that's also what's in my uh, Go Kit roll around with a charger that's set at about 14.4 volts on it. And, and that's all. Uh, those LIFP04 is a very, very safe batteries, and you can keep that charger on it forever and it won't bother it. Uh, John, I'm glad you uh, answered that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of lithium iron phosphate. I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of uh, lithium ion batteries because uh, they're inherently chemically unstable. So I uh, limit my use uh, uh, to lithium iron phosphate batteries because they are chemically stable. And if, uh, if you drop or damage a, a lithium ion battery, uh, it will supply its own oxygen and burn at extremely high temperature. And uh, you can very quickly have a catastrophic situation on your hands, even for small lithium ion batteries. So um, this is just my opinion, but um, when it comes to any kind of field deployable system, um, you know, test equipment like we, my, my company, there's, uh, there's some relay testers and all that technicians take out. Um, I, uh, I, I use lithium iron phosphate batteries. They're, they don't have quite the energy density of the lithium ion batteries, but they are lighter in weight and have better energy density than gel cells. So they're kind of compromised between the two. And uh, that's my recommendation. I don't mess with lithium ion batteries. The other problem with lithium ion is uh, you need to let them run down fairly low before you put them back on a charger because every time you charge them, it doesn't matter if they're almost full or almost empty. As soon as you put them on a charger, it starts those little dendrites growing between the plates inside. And eventually they puncture the insulator and that's what kills those batteries and can cause them to catch fire. Right, right, yeah. They're, they're to, in my way of thinking, a lithium ion battery in the house is, is a little bit like uh, uh, storing, uh, you know, uh, a Pepsi bottle with gasoline in it, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I, basement uh, 12. 
<laughs> and what do all your cell phones have in them? Well, they do, and I can't do anything about that, right? Uh, as well as some of the, the little electronic devices. But uh, as, as a general rule, uh, given the option, uh, I would uh, I, I go with the uh, lithium iron phosphate uh, batteries. Uh, let's see. That in all of my go kids. Yeah, and uh, so uh, that was uh, from Cindy. So you answered that. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, if somebody mentioned Greg, uh, I guess so. We we answered your question too, Greg. Yeah, definitely lithium iron phosphate. I consider better. Uh, and Roy, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I see you're signing out. Uh, David W9TAX did state that some inverter generators can produce RFI hash. Yes, that's a very important and valid point. Uh, in some respects, you get what you pay for. Uh, you know, the, the better quality generators, I haven't had this experience with them, but uh, that was not a problem, fortunately, with the old school, you know, high RPM generators. But uh, you might want to, when you buy a generator, uh, look into that issue and, and see if there's any complaints about RFI hatch ash from uh, from the uh, generator uh, excellent point uh, david i i appreciate you bringing that up uh other comments questions etc etc and uh so uh will slides be made available yes uh, we will place them on our web page here within the next few days and uh, so, matter of fact, uh, if if you guys like, I can uh, I can distribute the uh, the uh, slides via the uh, email list, and then you can use these uh, within your in your own Aries groups or amateur radio organization or, or whatever uh, you choose to do. Okay, I don't see any additional questions. Uh, one more chance before we call it. I have it a question. I have a comment. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Joseph. Um, Tom, Tom, G GPS. Offline maps, uh, you can store all the places you need to store. Um, you can save your cell phone for other things. The Tom, Tom will work off U USB, and you can run it for quite, quite a long time. And uh, it's pretty much up to date the last time you updated which should be good enough okay great information yeah uh yeah, absolutely so no i'm not not anti-gps necessarily or anything like that but uh i like having the paper maps at least as a backup and you know you can scribble on them and you know you can uh, take a highlighter and mark things that you need to mark and and so forth but yes you're you're absolutely right and that's good information for people to have i do appreciate it I keep uh, my old cell phones that no longer have the uh, cards in them, uh, a couple of them in my go kits, because you can use that to record all of your paperwork that you sign, which you really should have a copy of, because it is it is a legal document before you turn it in. Yeah. But uh, there's also a pouch that you can get to, with a lanyard on it that's clear, and you can set it to record and drop that in there, and now you've got a body cam. Oh, there you go. Not a bad idea. No, nope, not a bad idea at all. I think a lot of us have old cell phones floating around, uh, even iPhones, you know, that we, we don't use really anymore, but never got around to turning them in or, or otherwise disposing of them. So another great idea. And they still uh, interface with the Internet, whether you've got a card in them or not. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, I think with that, uh, I will uh, let everybody uh, uh, complete their night. There's two hours. I was trying to keep these to two hours or less. Uh, uh, we did a pretty good job again here uh, uh, with uh, just about exactly two hours. Uh, and I really appreciate everybody being here. Uh, really do. Uh, thank you for taking the time. And um, if you do have questions, I think everybody here knows how to get a hold of me. Uh, likewise, uh, just uh, I'll put in a quick plug for the RRI uh, MCOM uh, groups.io uh, and the traffic ops groups.io. Uh, you're welcome to register with those, and uh, it's a great place to ask these kinds of questions or discuss these kinds of topics. 
uh, at your convenience as well. So with that, everybody, uh, I'll say 73, and uh, I guess I'll see you at the next uh, training class. Uh, James, before you leave? Yeah. Um, on the Radio Relay Org website, under the training materials section, under the publication, uh, you have this presentation uh, labeled as TR003 below the ham watch, which is also la labeled TR003. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and correct that. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, any other uh, things before we go? Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you so much for being here. And I will end the call and enjoy your evening. And uh, we'll talk again. Uh, talk to everybody again soon. 73. 73, James. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.